Okay, so on this particular webinar, I'll be focusing on indoor air quality, which is a really important part of a healthy home. And there aren't many homes I walk into where I go, wow, the air quality in this house is awesome. Most of the time, it's not awesome, and it's contributing to allergies, it's contributing to respiratory problems, recurrent colds and flus, asthma, um, even skin conditions, air quality can affect eczema, for example. So what we're gonna do is have a look at what these hazards are likely to be, and more importantly, why every one of you needs an air filter. So as a building biologist, I go into people's homes in order to identify if their house is making them sick. We work with doctors, health practitioners, plumbers, trades. Basically, we're like the GP for the environment where we go in and take a thorough exposure history with the, with the client, identify their symptoms, and from those symptoms, we're able to determine, okay, this is what could be in the house that may cause those symptoms. So is that a problem here? And where's the evidence? How do we quantify those hazards? That might, may mean getting a lab involved and analysing the lab results. It may mean, you know, using um, electromagnetic field meters in order to quantify the actual exposures. So in this one, I'll be talking specifically about ambient air. And without doubt, one of the most important things I'm going to look at when I'm assessing a home is its proximity to potential hazards. The big one will be traffic. Traffic-related air pollutants are responsible for a significant proportion of lung and heart disease in the world. In fact, more people die from, from breathing in outdoor air in Australia than they do from the road toll. Road, road toll is about 2,000 or so people who die in a car every year. Um, more people will die from breathing poor air quality in Australia, let alone third world countries like China, India, where the pollution is even worse. Most people don't know that. So heavy traffic. Now, when we're talking about heavy traffic, I'm actually talking about if you've got cars stopping and starting, not just the local traffic and residents living in your street, but if you've got, say, a traffic light or a, a crossing or a school, you live on the same street as a school where you get a lot of cars coming, stopping and starting. When a car accelerates and when it, um, it, it actually emits more noxious gases like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, um, nitrous oxides, for example, which can irritate the lungs and cause asthma and allergic type symptoms. So if I'm looking to buy a house or pre-inspection order, I don't want it to be near um, traffic related air pollutants. I don't want it to be near the southeastern freeway or heavy traffic. The more lanes of traffic, the more air pollutants you'll be exposed to. And if people are stopping and starting at the front of my house, like a traffic light or a crossing, that's a big no. Because even when they're stopping, as I said, when they accelerate, they emit high levels of particles. Diesel would have to be the worst. And in fact, in the areas, for example, in um, um, the inner city areas, you're going to find high levels of air pollution as a result of traffic. Um, and of course, in suburbs where there are heavy trucks and B-doubles. So for example, ports, if your street is you know, on the way where a lot of B-doubles, which are very large trucks using diesel particles are going to a port or using as a thoroughfare, that is a massive big no. How do I know that? Well, first I'll look at the traffic related air pollutants on their specific websites that can tell you how many trucks actually go past that particular street, you know, the major arterial routes. Um, and what proportion could be diesel. Diesel is the worst of all of them, especially the older diesel trucks emit very fine, ultra fine particles. They also emit um, well, their carcinogens. Uh, when you combust um, vehicle exhaust can also contain known carcinogens like polyaromatic hydrocarbons. So when I'm going into a home where I know it's on a busy street, I'll often find that the the color of the dust at the front of the house on the window sills and along the surfaces will be dark, like black. That will be from the wear and tear of the tires, but it'll also be from the traffic, from the exhaust fumes and the particles in the fumes, which are incredibly toxic. So in those scenarios, if a patient is living in these homes, I would say you keep your windows and your doors shut, especially during peak hour, and you put an air filter at the front of the house. Often what you find as you walk to the back of the house, the colour of the dust gets lighter and lighter until it looks like just normal dust. 
but the front of the property, when it's close to traffic, heavy traffic, it's going to be black from the wear and tear of the tyres and potentially from diesel particles and, and other types of vehicle exhaust fine particles. So that's an absolutely big no. Farms, golf courses, parks are, especially golf courses, are a disaster. I had one of my top uh, naturopath colleagues who lives in Sydney, who's got a very busy practice, organic food, you know, virtually no chemicals, personal care products. And she said she lived a block away from a golf course. And I said, you know, the chances are you're going to have high pesticide levels because the exposure zone is two kilometres. If you live within two kilometres of a farm where there's crop dusting or golf course where they're spraying very heavily the pesticides and it often happens in the middle of the night so you don't even see it. And it's not a coincidence that many golf superintendents have a doubling the incidence of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a type of cancer because of the pesticides. So living within um, two kilometer radius is problematic. She had her bloods tested and they were off the chart and so were her kids. So they moved immediately to the Blue Mountains once she, she got herself tested. So this is really problematic. You know, living on a golf course, I remember once I did an audit where I, I went, he was living in a golf course and it was just, you know, short of moving out of the golf course. He was so excited about being there. I said, this is one of the very rare times I'll say, never ever open your windows and make sure you, you spend 10 grand on a proper air filtration system to do the entire house with carbon filters because you're gonna be exposed to known carcinogens. Pesticides are toxic. Pesticides are probably the most toxic chemical um, in my research. When I was looking at and wrote my first paper in 2016 on environmental chemical assessments and the elephant in the room, pesticides came up in almost every chronic disease from neurodevelopmental disorders like autism and um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, right to the other spectrum in the older people, dementia and Alzheimer's and especially Parkinson's. There is quite a lot of data in the scientific literature to show Parkinson's in farming in clusters where farmers are. So depending on the type of pesticides they use, they're, you know, um, they have higher incidences of Parkinson's. Interesting research was conducted and published in two, in two years ago in Australia to show Northwest Victoria has clusters of Parkinson's in farmers, which they associate with the use of pesticides. So pesticides are definitely my number one toxic, toxic chemical. So do not use them inside your house um, because they are toxic. When it comes to pest management, it's all in my book, you know, use fly screens. And good things about metal fly screens is they'll block and reflect radio frequencies from cell phone towers, which is another double-edged good thing. Make sure you don't leave food around the house and, you know, pet food where you're attracting rodents and flies, etc. You know, good housekeeping goes a very long way in creating good indoor air quality. But pesticides and um, chemicals used to kill uh, pests and insects is a big zero no way. That's probably the worst. So if you live near a park I, or a school, I would contact the school or the park the council and get their safety data sheet for the chemicals that they're using and, and find out how frequently they're using those chemicals and when they're spraying or using those chemicals and get the safety data sheet to, to determine what chemicals actually used, probably glyphosate or Roundup. And there's a lot of data on how toxic that is. Industry manufacturing, if you live near industry in a uh, industrial zone, like inner city Melbourne, for example, then you know that comes at a cost that can be, you know, very problematic because you could be the fumes from that. Like, you know, I did an audit of a house where they live next to a spray panel opposite on the other side of the road was an industrial zone. And on their side was a residential zone and they were opposite a spray paint, a panel beater and spray painter. It was just, you could smell it just by being, you know, at the front of their home. So manufacturing industry, it's really important, you know, like in um, Western suburbs, there's a lot of manufacturing going on there, et cetera. And that, that comes at a cost. So if you're living near there, the rule of thumb is to close all your windows and to um, have an air filter system. Shipping ports, coal trains, flight paths, really toxic. A lot of research there on, you know, um, industry exposures, for example. A shipping ports, it's mainly because of the amount of trucks going in and out of the port. So you've exposed to the traffic as well as whatever's being, whatever's at the port. And of course, the, um, um, you know, the shipping 
um, itself, you know, in terms of uh, exhausts, often because ports are associated with industry. So you have that as a double edged sword. Coal trains, interesting data from the Hunter Valley, and of course, um, children that live near in residential homes that are in close proximity to coal trains where the coal's coming off and the air quality is really poor. Coal, of course, is a known carcinogen. Um, with benzopyrenes, it's really toxic. Flight paths, you want to be at least seven kilometres away from a flight path. When planes are decelerating and accelerating, that's when they'll release most of their fumes and it's literally just fuming you every time it's coming in and out, you know, like in Sydney especially, in Hong Kong, oh, my God. You know, you, literally the people are living right next to the airports and that's, that's not good. If you've got heart disease or, or uh, lung problems or if you're chemically sensitive, this is a big no, so keep at least seven k's away. Construction sites, we all know they can emit large amounts of particles and uh, chemicals that they're used in construction. So if you've got someone renovating, next, you know, building a house next to you temporarily, you might just want to keep those windows closed and using an air filter in the short term. Bushfires emit very high levels of known carcinogens and uh, particles. Remember, the trees and plants are sequestering the air pollutants. So plants are the lungs of the planet and they sequester or they, they bind to many of the air pollution. So that's how they help clean the air. But when you have a bushfire, you're actually re-releasing these toxic metals that have been sequestered from the ground through the roots when they're bringing up the minerals, but also from the air and, and getting it becoming airborne. So bushfire um, air quality can be like smoking 10, 20 cigarettes a day. And that's why it's really important in a bushfire zone, it's providing you're not in danger of the fire, is to actually quickly seal everything up. Make sure your windows are sealed well, even if you have to use duct tape or anything like that, to seal them in the short term. And to put the air filter on is really, really important um, during bushfire seasons, which unfortunately is becoming more and more common. Open cut mines, disaster, Port Piri, Mount Isa, these kids have high levels of lead and other toxic metals in their body and they have very much higher rates of autism and ADHD because they're living in very contaminated sites. We know in your lawn, of course, in Gippsland, you know, it comes at a cost to human health. And generally the exposures, the zones for open cut mines is 70 kilometres, i.e. you shouldn't be living within 70 kilometres of an open cut mine, according to the research, because you'll be exposed to toxic metals and particles, air particles that could impact your, your lungs. So here on the Pacific Highway, if you live right there where that, um, that triangle is there, you will have 50,877 cars passing that street, 94% of which are cars and 6% will be trucks. <laughs> That's definitely not what you want, especially if you've got lung problems, asthma, or if you're chronic fatigue syndrome. Look, anyone, any healthy person, you don't want to be living near high levels of traffic. Um, the rule of thumb is you don't want to be living within 500 metres downwind from heavy traffic, and you don't want to be living within 200 metres radius of that traffic and 500 metres downwind, just, you don't want that. So air pollution hotspots that I've mentioned, I mentioned pesticides from crop dusting, but also golf courses are a big one, um, air pollutants from industry, flight paths, no more within seven kilometres of a flight path, and traffic, you know, if you live in inner city Melbourne, it comes at a cost to your health. Your lungs are going to have to be able to deal with the traffic, the noxious gases, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, all the polyaromatic hydrocarbons um, and the ultrafine particles that are emitted from traffic. So that comes at a cost. And uh, if you choose to live in inner city areas, then you know you definitely need an air filter or your, your body will become that filter. Mining, many, many mines throughout Australia. Um, and in my book, I highlight the, what the exposure zones are, not just for um, air pollutants, but of course for electromagnetic fields like power lines, high voltage transmission lines, and cell phone towers. Okay, so indoor air pollutants. And the big one first is to start with what's on the outside, because as soon as you open your window, that whatever's outside is going to be coming in. So I live in an area where it's very bushy, there's a lot of trees around me. Um, that means my gutters get clogged easily, so I have to clean them every six weeks or so. But I love the fact that I can look, after, look out every window and I see trees because they are 
the lungs instead of me and the kids they're actually filtering a lot of the pollutants I can't hear traffic when I'm inside because I'm in a quiet street I love that um, and that's important too if you can hear the traffic the chances are you'll be impacted by the air quality is generally the rule of thumb so make sure the outside is clean so when you open the windows it's going to bring in fresh air because a, a healthy home is one that smells like fresh air now within you've got lots of air pollutants inside um, depending on the room so starting with um, the bathroom as long as you have moisture sitting on a surface for more than 48 hours, you're gonna have mold and microbial growth. So the rule of thumb is a healthy home is a dry home. Uh, if you have liquid water on the surface, it's gonna support microbial growth. So if you have a flood, please dry it within 48 hours. Otherwise it'll go from a water restoration job to a mold remediation job. And it'll go from a couple hundred dollars to potentially tens of thousands of dollars in remediation. The other one is humidity. If you live in Sydney or in a humid environment where it's 70% or more relative humidity for more than two days, then everything in your house, every bit of dust in your house will be supporting microbial growth. That's the cost of living in a humid environment in the tropics, anywhere from Sydney, Central Coast and up, you're gonna be having a mold growth on all your dust. So it's really important to make sure that you have the dehumidifier to pull the moisture out of the air to keep the humidity levels between 45 and 55%. And I'll go through that in a minute. So mold is one of the worst. As soon as you have a mold problem, if you can smell mold, it's growing because it's releasing chemicals to try and kill each other off because the function of the mold is to decompose and decay your house. Mold is everywhere. It's meant to be everywhere, so is bacteria, so that's fine. It's only gonna be a health problem if you give it moisture and it's sitting on the surface for more than 48 hours. Then it starts producing chemicals to kill the other bacteria and its competitors. Unfortunately, you'll be in the way of that and that's when it can cause serious adverse health effects like asthma, allergies, uh, pneumonia, chronic bronchitis, uh, middle ear infections in children, for example, eczema sometimes, and of course, chronic fatigue syndrome or chronic inflammatory response. So mold is one of the biggest problems because once it starts growing, it releases hyphae and spores, which travel and sit on all the surfaces and cause high levels of what we call fungal particulate, which means that it could be growing this part, say your bathroom, because you don't have good ventilation, and now it's spreading spores and fungi through the rest of the house. That is an air quality problem. You can't see it and you won't smell it in the other areas, but you may be getting asthma, allergies and other things like that. And that's when a building biologist is going to be helpful to, to identify how far that fungal particulate is spread. We have a whole subject on that called mold testing, which will be available completely online and we'll be hiring out the test kits to enable our students to be able to do testing without having to come on campus because of the whole COVID thing going on at the moment. Also, air conditioning units. Wow, I have to say, I've come across one air conditioning unit that was clean in all my years I've been doing this. So if you look at your air conditioning unit, especially a split system that's on the wall, it's normally a refrigerated split system, um, and you get a torch, you should not see any dirt on the condensing coil, which is that sort of metal fins at the front. And when you open the blades and look behind the condensing coil, you should see nothing but plastic. It should be completely clean. If it's dirty, good chance, especially if it's black modelling, it's going to be Aspergillus penicillium or cladosporine, which are mycotoxin producing fungi that are incredibly dangerous to health. You must, must, must clean your air conditioning systems at least twice a year. If you don't, what happens is you're going to support potentially microbial growth and you're going to spread it from the air conditioning unit to that room and the adjacent rooms and people get sick. I've had homes that required tens of thousands of dollars in mold remediation simply because they didn't clean their split systems and it spread throughout the rest of the house. So the rule of thumb is mold doesn't grow on plastic, but it grows on dirt. So as soon as you have any dirt in the split system, which is why it has to be cleaned regularly, then when moisture comes along, the mould sitting in the dirt and the bacteria will start reproducing, creating chemicals and spores and high feet, which is why it's a problem. So rule of thumb, all your split systems must be, must be cleaned. 
your swamp coolers or your evaporative coolers which are on the roof they those trays need to be emptied if they're the older units and cleaned and you know um, high pressure hose is important to clean those as often as possible so don't underestimate the split system as i've said i've come across many mold related homes that have been contaminated just from that alone and that's what it looks like in the diagram you know the split system there um, in your living areas you're going to have a plethora of dust in the carpets because they are the, the uh, archaeological dig sites of your entire house. Every person that ever walked through your home, every pet, every animal, every plant has its DNA sitting in your carpet. Every hour you'll shed between 14 and 37 million bacterial genome copies into the air, which will be landing in your carpet. And this is going to take forensics to a whole new level of investigation as they're starting to discover since we mapped the human genome and PCR testing has come on the market in the last five years. So in your carpets, what do you have? You've got dirt um, from outside, you've got dust, um, you've got food debris, you've got hair, you've got dander. Most of the dust you have in your carpet is actually skin cells that you're shedding every day and your pets. And that's what the dust mite are living on. Dust mite is the most um, common allergy in the world. It impacts 21% of the world's population and it causes um, congested runny noses. It causes um, red itchy eyes. It causes cough. It causes hay fever like symptoms. And of course it can cause bronchitis and other things like this. So dust mites are common. If you, you'll know you'll have a dust mite allergy if you're having sneezing attacks or if you're constantly irritated like hay fever like symptoms all year round. That's classic for dust mite. Often is worse first thing in the morning and during the night because most of these little suckers are actually in your pillow and your bed. This is why how you deal with your pillow and your bed and, and housekeeping is so important. So you're, every time you clean your bed sheets, say two times a month or so, you should be airing your pillows outside when you put your, you know, clean your bed sheets, put your pillow outside as well, especially in dry sun, because the UV will kill off the bacteria and dry out the pillow. You're releasing a lot of moisture and sweating a lot during the night, especially if you're unwell, if you've been on chemotherapeutic drugs, or if you're postmenopausal, um, you'll be sweating quite a lot more, and that will support more, more microbial growth. So please make sure you air your pillows every time you do your bed sheets outside. Mattresses need to be aired. Now, in some cultures, they do it every week or every month. Most Australians have no idea. I haven't met anyone that airs their mattresses unless they're European. So if it's too heavy, then what you can do is just lift the mattress and, and just put it to the side of the bed so that the sunlight coming from the window can hit it and you can air both sides. First thing I'll look at as a building biologist is making sure that the um, the mattress can air from underneath. I don't want any clutter under the bed. It needs to be aired and I want slats. I don't want this particle board and these, these um, bed kits that children have where they've got drawers under their bed and there's literally no way for the mattress to air from underneath. That will support more microbial growth and it will reduce the life of your mattress. If the mattress is exposed to urine, you never, never pass down mattresses to children from one sibling to the other because they're going to be loaded with urine and loaded with microbial growth. You want a clean mattress or a new mattress, ideally for every child that comes into the family because of the fact that it'll be just harboring all of these microbial and dust mite and, and other things like this. So with your carpets, they contain also things like... Um, um, fibres like synthetic mineral fibres from insulation bats, could be lead dust, it could also be asbestos dust, microbes, bacteria, fungi, um, insect parts, for example, cockroach or frass, which is like parts from insects like cockroaches and rodent urine. It's like mm, you get a UV torch out and it's just like, oh, my God, I don't want to know <laughs> what's in people's carpets, but they're the archaeological dig site. So for a six-carpeted room home, you, you will accumulate about 20 kilos of dust every year for the rest of that carpet's life. That's why, you know, in my case, when my daughter has dust mite allergy, the first thing I did is pull the carpet out of the house. And um, I, I use a microfiber cloths, mops, in order to, to mop that, you know, at least twice a week. All right, tobacco smoke. You know, if you smoke inside the house, well, you know, there's no point doing any of this until you get rid of the big elephant. So smoking inside the house 
big no. If you have to smoke, smoke outside, not near an open window, obviously, because that's going to be an issue. If you're in a house where they've had drug manufacturing, that's going to be a problem. You want to check the history of that because it's going to be imprinting all over the walls and there's nothing you can do about it except rip it to frame and start again. So that's another one. Um, in terms of other things, all your personal care products, cleaning products, they're going to be sources of chemicals that will contaminate the air in your home. Um, any chemicals you're using like Scotch Guard and other things like that, they're incredibly toxic. So really you need to reduce your toxic load and not buy half the shit that's available in the shops that has probably never been tested for its impact on human health. Every 20 seconds, every 60 seconds, another 20 chemicals are registered for use on the world's largest database, the Chemical Abstract Service. Um, there are currently over 181 million chemicals registered for use on this, CAS.org, which, which is a US um, organization. When you get your safety data sheet, you'll see the CAS number. This is the organization that collates all that data. So indoor air quality, first thing, clutter. You've got to get rid of the clutter. If in doubt, you know, either give it to the op shop, give it to someone who's going to value what that is, you know, um, don't throw out your plastics because well, the globe's already in a shocking state. Now we've got plastics moving up the food chain through our fish, our kids, God knows, it's just so bad, isn't it? I don't even know where to start. So clutter, you've got to sort that out. It's, it's a real problem because it's holding the dust. It means poor airflow. It potentially means a lot more mould and fungal particulate. So ordering and clutter is number one. You've got to deal with that. There's some great professional organisers out there that can assist you with that. If you're on NDIS, then I believe you can put a proportion of your funding towards a professional organiser. We'll be offering the first professional uh, decluttering course in Australia. This will be part of the feng shui course, but you can do it as an individual subject called decluttering that will come onto the market as of next year. Smoking, cooking. The more you cook inside the house, if the ventilation is not right, the more air quality you're going to have, air problems you're going to have. So often I find, for example, in Asian families and Indian families where they have three generations living in the house, the elderly parents, like you guys, um, are cooking two or three times meals a day. So when you're grilling, when you're frying, um, et cetera, you're releasing high levels of ultrafine particles in that room. And if the ventilation isn't good, most older homes, the ventilation, the exhaust fan doesn't go anywhere. It sounds like it's doing something often. It's not doing anything. And it's just, um, you know, allowing all that oil, et cetera, just to move inside. And that will imprint on the walls, et cetera. You can often smell it when you're, when you're um, you know, walking in. So it's really important the exhaust fan goes not just to the roof, but outside to the exterior, um, not and flashed properly, of course, not, you know, just recirculating and not doing anything like so many of them are. Um, smoking, obviously a big problem. Open fireplace. If you have an open fireplace, that is a big hazard. Open fireplaces, unflued gas heaters are a big no. Why? Because they can backdraft that, that smoke into the living space, contaminate every part of that space, and is incredibly uh, toxic to your lungs. If you've got an open fireplace that backdrafts in the room, you might as well have smoked 10 cigarettes that day because it's incredibly toxic. It emits ultrafine particles, particulate matter of different sizes, and of course, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which are uh, like benzopyrenes, which are known carcinogens. And of course, someone has to clean the open fireplace. So as they're doing this, unless they've got a full face respirator and a P3 um, uh, res respirator, they're going to be exposing and inhaling huge amounts of very toxic um, particles. So open fireplace, mm. a canara is better where it's concealed and it will be a better form of heat. But someone, one sucker in the house is going to have to clean it. And ideally, they need to wear gloves and of course, a respirator when they do that. Incense smudging. Incense can release four times more particles than cigarette smoke. I love space clearing my house, but I do it maybe once or twice a year. If you're using incense, you'll find if people are doing it daily, you can walk in their house and it smells like incense and they're not burning it because all of those particles and chemicals have now imprinted into the gyp rock and into, into their furnishings and everywhere. And that's really toxic. So I would strongly suggest incense smudging be done very rarely. Uh, maybe as part of space clearing and a ritual, fair enough. But when you do it, keep your windows open because it's very, very toxic. And there isn't a safe incense or smudging regardless of what it's made of because the smoke itself is what's toxic. 
pets, love my pets. I have a boxer dog who's crazy, but they bring in, you know, they don't take their shoes off before they come into the house. So they're bringing in all that stuff. Half the time he's bringing in chicken poo because the chickens just poo everywhere around outside. And, you know, I have to wipe his feet, which is not practical. Um, so Leo has his own dedicated mat. He's not allowed in the bedrooms, um, but he has a dedicated mat where he knows he can stay and that's important. So, you know, I can't keep him outside because, you know, he's part of the family. Um, birds, I've gone into people's homes that have birds flying all over the place. You know, that's that's a big no. I mean, what can I say? If you've got birds shitting and flying all over your house, I mean, I just walk in there and go, you know, what's the point in talking about <laughs> other stuff when there's a big elephant right in front of your face because the birds just flying past you and, and shat on their timber boards? Yeah, you know, computer says no. I've been to houses where they allow their dog to defecate in the house. Like, you know, I go in there and go, and I write my report, please don't let your dog shit in your house or urinate. I had one client where I was talking to the client in the kid's bedroom and the dog came and urinated in the corner and she didn't stop talking to me as I'm watching the dog and the dog walked down. I said, excuse me, but he's just urinating. Oh, yeah, that's where he likes to urinate. You know, what do you say? Like, what do you say to that? Yeah. Mold, water damage buildings. Um, big issue, a healthy home is a dry one. As soon as you have mold, if you can smell it and you can see visible mold, and I'm not just talking about a little bit of visible mold in the grout of the tiles, I'm talking about, you know, potentially a drainage issue, plumbing issue. Um, I'm talking about a water event that wasn't dry, then, you know, that's very problematic and that's going to be a huge contributing factor to poor air quality. Don't use pesticides in the home. Perfumes, air fresheners are toxic and because they're not regulated and they don't come with a, all the safety data sheets, they are problematic. Do not have perfume or air fresheners in your home. Uh, many of them are known carcinogens and because of trade secrecy laws, the company doesn't have to tell you the 500 petrochemicals that are in that particular perfume. If you're going to use smells, use essential oils. Unless you're chemically sensitive, don't use anything. So I use my essential oils in an oil burner and I have that um, in the house, but I don't use conventional perfumes or air fresheners. Cleaning and personal care products. You know, I'm really, after I finish my PhD in the next four weeks, I'm going to start writing my book, Get That Shit Off Your Face, um, and help to educate women why most of the stuff they buy is actually accelerating aging and, in fact, increasing their exposure to phthalates or hormone disrupting chemicals that increase the risk for breast cancers and infertility. But that's in my next webinar. No, I'm kidding. I'm not doing a webinar on that. Too depressing just read the book all right so what's in the air air is made up of lots of gases primarily nitrogen which accounts for about 78 percent of the air oxygen for about 21 percent and carbon dioxide is only about 400 parts per million or 0.04 percent it is rising because of the whole greenhouse gases unfortunately carbon dioxide is a good marker of, of poor ventilation if you get 800 parts per million in a space, which you can easily do if you have three or four people in a living space, then you'll start to get drows drowsy and it affects cognitive function. So your ability to concentrate. So don't have a whole, if the kids are starting at homeschooling, try and keep one child to one room to make sure the ventilation's good, maybe open the window a little bit to ensure that those carbon dioxide levels are low because you breathe out about 40,000 parts per million with every exhalation. Particles in the air, there's about 35 million particles in a cubic metre of air in clean air and about 1 billion in dirty air. How do you know it's dirty? Because it looks dusty, it's cluttered, it's hoarding, smells dusty, that's a problem and your lungs have to deal with that. Now, I've already mentioned all the things that could be in the air and most of these are also sitting in the household dust. So if you don't get a filter, your body will become the filter. And I'm here to tell you, your body is amazing your body's capacity to filter is extraordinary so starting with this we start with the nose you have cilia or hair like projections in the nose which will trap a lot of the particles above 20 microns so your hair one hair in your head is about 80 microns in diameter about 80 to 100 microns um, your nose will filter right down to about 20 microns and it will have mucus in your noses there to trap these particles and sneeze them out it's incredibly healthy so don't start cutting the the um, nose hair etc which some people do unless they're hanging out that's that's gross 
Of course, then we have the, in the respiratory system, we have these beautiful surface areas or conchae in the upper, resp upper respiratory tracts, which increases surface area to trap more dust. How amazing is that? You then have the capacity to get dust and then spit it out. So that's another protective mechanism your body has. You also have this, what we call the mucociliary tract, which is mucus and cilia and hair-like projections right up through the bronchi and the bronchioles. So it traps these particles and slowly brings it up all the way so you can cough it up or sneeze. Amazing thing. So cough and sneezing reflex are a protective mechanism of your body to try and get rid of a lot of these uh, particles. This is the cilia in an electron, micro in an electron microscope picture and of course nose hair I would definitely encourage him to snip those so here's an example of the cilia moving the mucus if you smoke you've killed your cilia so smoking kills the cilia or the fine light projections that that run throughout your respiratory tract and that's why your incidence of lung cancer increases significantly because you have no way of getting rid of those particles from the lower respiratory tract in your lungs and that's why you end up getting really sick when you stop the good news is when you stop smoking a lot of the cilia do grow back so that's a good thing all right, so let's have a look at particle sizes because this is important to know, depending on the air filter you wanna buy, you need to know what part of pollens. So they're large particles from 10 to 100 microns. And you'll often see pollens as yellow pollen. So if you've got wattle trees near you, et cetera, you'll see it that way. Tobacco smoke is small from one micron or less. So to be able to filter tobacco smoke, you need you know, a HEPA filter. Animal dander or skin cells, which some people who are allergic to animals will react to, goes from about one micron to about seven microns. Remember, one hair in your head is 80 microns in diameter, so you're not going to see this with a naked eye. Asbestos, hair, etc. Uh, having a look at here in terms of what the body can filter down to around 2.5 microns, and that's the mucociliary tract. But of course, then we have other things like fungi, bacteria, different types of bacteria here and uh, fungi, of course, um, which can all be in the air that we breathe. So air filters, an air filter is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Why? Even if you live in a clean environment like I do, um, bushfires happen. And of course, a big one is in my area, a lot of people have open fireplaces. So I can actually smell the open fireplaces burning from outside when I'm walking along the street. Eltham, Warrandyte, you know, Montrose, these bushy areas, a lot of people have open fireplaces and they'll affect the air in your home when you open a window. So for that case, you'd want an air filter. So there are different types of air filters and it depends on what's in them. The first one is mechanical filters, then electrostatic filters, carbon filters, ozone generators, UV sterilizers and humidifiers and dehumidifiers aren't filters, but I'll talk about them because they're important for mold remediation. So the first thing I wanna talk about with the filter is the mechanical filter is the most important part that you wanna look at in a filter. They trap particles by straining by intercepting, impacting, or diffusing the particles. And you can see here, um, these are the particles within a HEPA filter, for example, that will help to literally, they're physically trapping the particle. The filter effectiveness will be dependent on what it's made of, um, its shape and its size. So pleated filters are generally much better because they have much higher surface areas. And of course, the bigger the filter is, the more effective it will be. The problem is when you're looking at HEPA filters is you need an, a pump to push the air through because it's so fine and difficult to get the air through that, that um, pump. Unlike electrostatic cleaners, media filters like this become efficient. So the more clogged the HEPA filter becomes, the more effective it becomes. That's different to every other filter. So HEPA filters, the more clogged they get, the more effective they become at filtering particles. Now you're gonna have mechanical filters like this in your vacuum cleaner. Everyone should have a vacuum cleaner with a HEPA filter because what you're pushing through when you're vacuuming the floor is all of these things I talked about in the carpet. You don't want it to become airborne because most your bag won't be containing most of those particles. It'll be coming out of the air of the vacuum cleaner, but the HEPA filter will contain most of it. And in fact, the air that comes out of the back of the vacuum cleaner with a HEPA filter is much cleaner than the air being sucked in from the carpet. In uh, physical or mechanical filters, 
there are two ratings. We have MERV filters and we have HEPA filters. And I'm not going to go into it because it's boring, but if you're interested, you certainly learn about it in the air pollution subject in the building biology course. MERV filters rating are based on the ASHRAE standard 52.2. They're primarily used for air conditioners and dehumidifiers. Generally, the MERV filter would need a rating of at least 13 or higher, it goes up to 20, in order to be considered HEPA-like. HEPA filters are considered to be the best. So if you're going to buy an air filter, you definitely want one with a HEPA filter. And these are examples of HEPA filters. You can see here the pleated, um, it's normally polypropylene. They're actually filtering, you know, most of your particulates down to 0.3 microns, which is amazing. That's your pollens. All your allergens are started about two microns and higher. So if you suffer from asthma or allergies, um, or you have respiratory problems, etc., then you know HEPA filters are definitely the way to go. There are different types of HEPA filter. High efficiency particulate air is what it stands for. You want a true HEPA filter because HEPA-like and HEPA-type are actually not as effective. A true HEPA filter will be at least 99.97% effective at reducing, um, at filtering particles um, below 0.3 microns. HEPA-like and HEPA-type aren't. The second type of filter is an electrostatic or ionizer. They capture particles by an induced electrical charge. So basically the particles receive an electrical charge and stick to a series of grounding plates, which is then washed away. The disadvantages is they lose efficiency within hours. So they're not that useful. They need to be cleaned a lot and they produce can produce ozone, which is really toxic. It's an eye, skin and lung irritant. So electric, Electrostatic filters and ionizers are generally not recommended. One thing you want to know when you're buying an air filter is its capture zone. How much air is it going to filter? And where you put that air filter is really important. If you shove it in the corner of the room, it's not going to be doing an effective job as opposed to being in the middle of the room. So a freestanding HEPA filter will have a limited capture zone, but if you duct it and put a duct like this, you'll actually increase its capture zone quite significantly. Generally, the rule of thumb is do not use activated carbon filters in a damp environment, but we'll go into that in a minute. Carbon, a carbon filter is really important if you want to filter chemicals and gases. HEPA filters filter particles. They do not filter gases or chemicals, but carbon filters do. Generally, one gram of activated carbon will have over 500 square metres of surface area. It is a remarkable capacity to filter chemicals. So if you're chemically sensitive and, you want, and you've just painted your house like I did recently, I will have a air filter that has a HEPA filter and a carbon filter because the carbon filters doing the one is, is getting rid of the chemical smells. That's really important. HEPA does particles, carbon does chemicals and gases. The effectiveness of that carbon filter, of course, will depend on how well it was um, the micron size and the pore size within the carbon. Now, this will depend on when it's put into a chamber in an oxygen deprived chamber and heated at very high temperatures, it will determine its pore size. So the smaller the pores, the more effective it will be. When you get your filter, ask what is the pore size of the carbon filter? If it's one micron, one micron is going to be 10 times more effective than a 10 micron carbon filter. Now, when I'm talking filters, I'm also talking, everything that I'm talking about also relates to water filters. You know, you've got your, except with the HEPA, um, you know, in terms of um, filtration methods. Disadvantages of carbon filters is they lose efficiency as they clog up, so you have to replace them often. Um, often they'll have a pre-sediment filter to protect the, the life of the carbon filter. So a good air filter will have multiple stages of your filtration system to prolong the life of the carbon filter. Because of course, you know, it's going to get expensive that you have to replace the filters regularly. Bacteria can grow in the filter, especially if they get um, moist. That's why carbon filters should not be used in mouldy homes because it can support microbial growth. Um, Carbon filters generally not recommended in shower filters, for example, when you're having shower to filter your water because it supports microbial growth, you're better off using a KDF filter. Uh, it's very difficult to predict the life of the carbon filter because um, we don't know its, its capacity to absorb and how much um, chemicals it's been exposed to, etc. So it should be replaced regularly. Choosing an air filter, the features are you want HEPA and you want carbon. So if you're, you know, you definitely want a dual system. 
the capture size is important. The more expensive the unit is, the more it's going to filter. You know, you want to know how many square meters of that of the room will it filter. So if you get a small filter, say this big, it might only filter, you know, just maybe 20 square meters. But if you get a larger one for a, a large living room, you know, that might filter 100 square meters. So make sure you tell the person you're buying the air filter from the size of the room that you want to filter. Also a good idea to get portable filters. I've got three air filters at home. So when, you know, recently with the painting, I used it for that. I use it in my daughter's room. Because we've got ducted heating, I'll use it in my daughter's room because the ducted heating, you know, blows dust from the floor. So I'll put an air filter in her room because as I said, she has dust mite allergies. And the cost of course will depend on your budget. Avoid UV sterilizers and ozone generators. They, a UV sterilizer used to kill bacteria. There's no place for UV sterilizer in the home. The only place I'd recommend a UV sterilizer in a home is for if you've got tank water and you want to kill off the microbes in your tank water, in the water itself. But I do not recommend UV sterilizers in the house or in for air filtration. Ozone generators are incredibly toxic. You have to normally not be in the house when they're there because they're a skin, lung and um, throat irritant. So no ozone generators. There are many air filters on the market and to disclose, I sell the Oz Climate in the Innovair, um, Innova Air. I find them really good. Oz Climate have a good budget range of air filtration systems. Innovair have the high end range. Um, she they, uses uh, Innovair, which is what Dr. Little recommends. Right, yes. She recommends him. She uses the same thing that he recommends, which I said before, the Innovare. Yes. The reason why that's a great one is because it's metal. In water damage time, I'm finding if it's a plastic uh, air filter, then, you know, you can get fungal particulate imprinting in the filter and a lot of people with chronic inflammatory response will react to that. Whereas Innovare is an Australian-made air filter and it's metal so it's easier to clean with a microfiber cloth and it's a hospital very very large HEPA filter. as I said I've got them on my website I do sell them but they're more expensive you know triple the cost but it's a system that's gonna you don't need to replace the air filter as much I also have the Oz climate ones I have in the house and they're great especially in the kids rooms etc so there's quite a lot on the market. What I want to show you is what to look, what are the features you want to look for in air filter, because there's lots on the market that you can get. Um, so make sure you ask those questions about the HEPA and carbon filter. All right, so getting onto humidifiers. These are not filters. A humidifier is, one, is something that puts moisture in the air and a dehumidifier actually moisture for the air. Now, the Sorry, there's, there's some interference. Someone's got their microphone. Like, there's a lot of interference. Somebody has unmuted. Yes. So whoever spoke just before, could you mute yourself, please? Because I can't do it from here. Let me see. Mute, mute, mute. Yep. I can't see. So here it is. Unfortunately. And things like that. Yeah. Look. Yep. That's better. Great. So humidity. Um, the ideal humidity range to prevent asthma attacks and to prevent microbial growth. Monica, mute. Yeah, is between 45 and 55%. So that's important. 45 to 55% is the, is the most ideal. If you can get that in your house, you will reduce most allergies and most um, respiratory related problems. Anything above 60% humidity, so if you live in Sydney, if you live in um, Central Coast and, and humid areas, it's going to support the proliferation of dust mites and, of course, mould. So it's really important in those areas that you have a dehumidifier to keep the humidity levels below 60%. You want to keep it between 40 and 60%, even better, 45 to 55%. Um, and there's no way around it. This is what I say to my clients in Sydney, et cetera. Look, the cost of living in a humid environment is that you're going to have to dehumidify the house. Otherwise, you're going to have mould growing in your house. And that's nothing you can do about it because that's the cost of living in a humid environment. Dehumidification, permanent dehumidification is important, preferably one with a high grass stat. So it kicks in automatically, uh, you know, if it's above 60% and it stops if it drops below 40% relative humidity. Humidifiers, do not use a humidifier. A humidifier puts moisture in the air. A lot of mothers tend to buy it from the chemist if they've got kids with dry respiratory problems and they put it on they've got all this moisture in the kid's room, they've got condensation dripping off the walls and now they've got mould. So, you know, that's a big no. There's no place for a humidifier. A dehumidifier, however, 
very useful if you live in a humid environment. And of course, if you've had a water event, dehumidifier will help pull the moisture out of the air, which is useful. So tips. What are the tips to create good air quality inside the house? The first and the most important is take your shoes off because you will be tracking all the pesticides at the council spray and the farmer spray, which is all over the globe, into your home. You don't want to do that because then your children, your babies are crawling all over it and that's their breathing zone. So the first rule of thumb, this is what I love about the Asian culture, is they have slippers specifically dedicated for the inside of the house. That's a really good rule of thumb. So take your shoes off. Don't wear them inside. Have separate shoes for inside or slippers. Dust with a microfiber cloth. So the microfiber cloth you can see here, slightly damp, and then have a microfiber cloth that you use and then follow it through with a clean tea towel. That's how you dust the house. Make sure you dust the house. You don't want to see dust of wind seal on the wind seals and window sills and, you know, on, on furnishings. You just... It's how you deal with the dust will determine, you know, what you're exposed to in the air. So dusting is important. You're going to deal with it by having a really good vacuum cleaner fitted with a HEPA filter. And you're going to dust the house with a slightly damp microfiber cloth followed by a dry tea towel. That's the rule of thumb. You don't need chemicals. The vacuum cleaner needs to have a filter. You can't retrofit it. It has to be bought with it. On my website, probably the best vacuum cleaners are Miele. But not all of the brand models are good. You want to make sure it has a HEPA filter. You want to make sure it has a motorized head. Pets outside, mm, I couldn't do that with my dog, or sleep on a dedicated mat, and certainly not in the bedrooms. It's best not to be in the bedrooms. Air bedding regularly, I've already spoken about why that's so important. Mattresses, you know, if you've got someone who's on, who's dealing with cancer on chemotherapeutic drugs, you shouldn't be sleeping next to them because you will be absorbing the chemicals coming out of their sweat, which is so toxic that even mold remediators know not to touch a mattress where someone's been on chemo because it can come through your fingers and absorb through your skin. So that's important thing that a building biologist will um, educate clients about. Remove carpets. That's a big one, remove the carpets. Replace flexible ducts. If you've got allergies, or chemically sensitive, I strongly suggest that you actually spend the money getting a good vacuum cleaner and replacing the flexible ducts. And I'm talking about the ducts in the subfloor. So, you know, the ducted uh, heating vents where they've got that flexible duct, they are impossible to clean. So if you've got them cleaned, you're probably being ripped off because they're not, you, you can't clean them. What I suggest you do is with your vacuum cleaner, the clean into the duct as much as possible. But the reality is those flexible ducts are not possible to clean and it's far more effective to actually replace them. For a house like mine, which is relatively small, it might cost me about $1,200 to replace all the flexible duct. But if I was moving into a house and I've got kids with allergies, which I do, that's the biggest bang for your buck is to do that. Get rid of the carpets, do that. Get rid of fabric um, curtains. They are a disaster for dust mite for poor airflow and mould. So it's really important that you, you know, replace your um, window uh, furnishings with blinds that you can clean um, with your microfiber cloth, for example. So um, that's important. Mould remediation, if you've got any mould in the house, you need to get it remediated because that could be the main contributing factor to, to lung problems or health related issues. Plants, plants are so beautiful. You know what we're doing to the Amazon basin, etc. And you know, plants are the lungs of the planet. We need plants. Go and start planting plants. <laughs> um, you know, not just for the whole carbon issue, but because they're the lungs of our planet. You know, it, it, some of these plants are so effective at, at um, purifying the air. The peace lily is probably the best. The more broadleaf the plant is, the more effective it is at purifying the air in your house. The only problem with that is Bill Wolverton's research from NASA when he was working on the biosphere in the 90s, he showed that you need one plant per square metre in order to have a, an impact on air quality. So unless you live in a jungle, that's not viable. But when I walk into a house and I see a dead peace lily, I'm worried because, you know, you can't kill these plants unless you either neglected it or the environment or the air quality is that bad. So peace lilies are beautiful. What I love about my peace lily Mergs, I even named them, is that when she starts wilting, she's dehydrated, which means the air is too dry in the house. So, you know, it's the amazing things, plants, especially the peace lilies. They're very effective at, at um, absorbing formaldehyde. And the way that these types of plants deal with 
with dealing with the chemicals is they do it through bacteria in the soil. And these bacteria actually um, metabolizes and starts transmuting the chemicals. They also do it in pores in their leaves. So obviously you're not gonna have plants that you're gonna eat inside because if they're absorbing all these chemicals, you don't wanna eat them. But you know, plants like peace lilies, the Kenchia palm and Janet Craig are some of the best for reducing chemical emissions. Um, they also reduce airborne molds and bacteria by at least 50%. They absorb carbon dioxide, like, wow. You know, a big problem with an unhealthy home is you have high levels of carbon dioxide because you're breathing it out. The major polluters of carbon dioxide are actually us because we breathe it out. So the plants absorb it and they release oxygen and we give them carbon dioxide. What a beautiful synergistic relationship we have. You know, it's not a coincidence that, that this is part of our biosphere to support life. So bacteria and plants are such a critical part of the ecosystem. And I think a healthy home should reflect uh, nature in every possible way. They also have important psychological benefits. So, you know, I like to, to keep my plants, um, some plants inside. All right, for more information about healthy homes, refer to my book, Healthy Home, Healthy Family. You can get that through my website. Lots of tips on my website, buildingbiology.com.au. Every month we have a free webinar and the next webinar will actually be on Chinese astrology and um, looking at how your birth chart can reflect your stuff, can reflect your shadow side, but more importantly, give you an insight as to why you are the way you are. And also in terms of this Vic Ketis, who's an incredible lecturer, will be going in and looking at what's happening globally now and what it's, it's um, you know, the type of issues that it's bringing up for many of us and um, what it means in terms of human evolution. So this is not a coincidence that the astrology is reflecting a lot of what's happening. So he'll give it an insight for those who, who want to have a look at that. He's incredible. Um, uh, gifted at both Western and Chinese astrology. So he'll give some insights into that. The dates of that are on our website, on the college website, which is aces.edu.au. Um, the Australian College runs nationally accredited training in building biology, mold testing, electromagnetic field testing, and the cert for in feng shui, where the decluttering subject is found. And for this webinar, we'll be providing until the 15th of September, um, our course on healthy homes. It's a subject, it's over 100 hours in duration, 12 weeks online, should be dedicating about 10 hours a week. It's normally 795 for this, we'll be offering at 495 without assessments. The code is amazing since. And um, if you want to enroll in that subject, you'll be learning a lot about what I've talked about, but more on allergens, as well as other types of air filtration systems, uh, chemicals in the home, how to reduce your load, et cetera. So that's a nationally accredited subject. All right. So I'm gonna stop this recording.